Good morning, or or a good afternoon, or a good evening, depends where you are. So, um, first of all, let me extend my heartfelt thanks to um, Will and uh, the whole Macmillan Education team for uh, having me contribute to this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful festival featuring you know so many dedicated professionals. We're here to do our best, you know, to. Um, give you some food for thought and maybe who knows with a little uh, with a little luck you know even inspire you um my talk is on motivation um motivation is a very complex um vast phenomenon it's also fascinating and i have never met a teacher you know who's not interested in how to motivate uh, the learners now um it is it, it is basically motivation is why we do what we do so as teachers you know we're always interested and in that we have this necessity you know to find out you know what makes our learners click so if we understand that well then you know we can exploit it and we we can turn things you know to our own advantage so in this in this um webinar we're going to be talking about motivation what it is but also what it isn't because you know there's quite a few misconceptions about the whole idea of what uh, motivation is all about and i'm also especially you know going to stress the connection between motivation and our uh, emotions Okay, so that's basically you know what's on my what's on my agenda. Um, the the first thing really is to highlight you know the interconnection you know between motivation and emotion. There is a really a recent study in the in the Cognition and Emotion Journal that actually shows uh, how emotions you know play a crucial role in uh, in uh, uh, in motivation. In fact, you know we know that. We know how, how, and I think, you know, I can show you that my first slide. We know, you know, from research, you know, how emotions impact not just motivation, but impact, you know, the whole learning process. If you look at my slide, you know, a positive emotions, or some people talk about a pleasant emotion. So, but a pleasant emotion is something like excitement, joy, okay, happiness. So um, if you're feeling good about yourself, if you have a pleasant, if you're experiencing pleasant emotions, this is always, always, you know, this is going to have a washback effect. I psychologically, you feel better about school, so you you feel more ready to be engaged, and um, and um, and and so. Um, you're looking forward, you know, to spending time with your teachers and within your group. It has a big um, um, impact on motivation. Obviously, you know, if you're feeling. If you're feeling um, uh, again happy, excited, you know, uh, joyful, obviously, you know, the this is all going to result in in uh, increased engagement. It has an impact on the social links and the social connections. You know, we don't just go to school for knowledge and to acquire skills. We also go to school, you know, to uh, to acquire other sets of skills, and that is social uh, uh, social skills. We're all human. We're all animal, uh, yeah, social animals. So, um, and also, you know, uh, positive emotions, uh, pleasant emotions have a big impact on uh, focus and memory. So this is what we know from research. So we have to take that into consideration if we have to make, uh, if we have to uh, basically, you know, um, make any strides in all this. Um, first of all, have you ever noticed motivation and emotion share the same etymological root? And that uh, both words come from the Latin movere, motum. Okay, that's why we talk about mo motivation is in terms of drive, you know, the drive to learn, the drive to do this, the drive to do that. And I think it's really interesting. Okay, so, and the other thing, you know, that, that that's very interesting, you know, to consider, you know, when, when we focus on the etymological roots of the word motivation and emotion is that uh, we talk about motivation in dynamic. Uh, it's uh, as a dynamic phenomenon. Okay, and that's the bad news for teachers. Okay, so so motivation doesn't stay static. Okay, so the fact you know that my students you know look motivated when I first meet them on a Monday morning, unfortunately for me, doesn't mean that they're going to be able to sustain the same degree of motivation throughout the semester, throughout the course, and sometimes throughout the lesson. So uh, motivation doesn't work as a straight arrow. It's more of a roller coaster kind of thing. That's why it's 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 called a dynamic phenomenon. If it were static, you know that that you know it, it would probably it would probably be better for for us. Um, 
what are we talking about when we talk about motivation? Remember what we said before, motivation is why we do what we do. So why, why do students learn? Why do students come to school? Why do students you know, take English classes in our case? And what is the difference between A motivation, D motivation, and simply lack of interest? Well, A motivation is really serious. A motivation, the first one on the list, is like when a student you know, shows no desire to learn whatsoever. Okay, so they just don't want to be there. They're not motivated. Okay, so when this happens, you know, there's very little that we can do, except, you know, that we need to dig deeper and find out, you know, why the, the student is feeling the way he or she is. Okay, so remember, you know, that teenagers are, in this case, you know, we're talking about teenagers. Teenagers, you know, are, are, are struggling with a whole lot of issues, okay, and motivation is, is uh, it's not, it's not always, you know, very easy for them to, to push themselves, you know, to, to, to engage in some kind of task. That's a motivation. Demotivation is not so serious. Demotivation is when a student, you know, seemed motivated at the beginning of a class, for example, at the beginning of a course, at the beginning of a semester, at the beginning of the academic year, but then, you know, along the way, he or she lost this kind of motivation. So they had it in the beginning, okay? They lost it along the way. So what has happened? And again, it is our task, it is our job, it is our responsibility to find out, you know, where the motivation went, okay? And if possibly, you know, if we could get it back and how. So it may be because, you know, the student is going through a rough time. It may be because the student is experiencing um, a, a very, very difficult time in his or her private life. It may be simply, you know, that this is a, it's one of the pangs of, of, of growing older. And so it, of, of, it, could, could be, it, it may be, it may be to do that the student, you know, doesn't feel you know, um, uh, accepted, you know, in, in, in the group. It may be, you know, that he or she doesn't like the way we teach. It may be that he or she doesn't relate to the materials that we're using in class. It may be, you know, a variety of different reasons. Okay, so, so but demotivation is not as serious as motivation. You can always get back. Sometimes, though, you know, there, a student here is looking apathetic, is looking demotivated, is looking lethargic, okay? And we, we just, you know, chalk it up, you know, the lack of motivation. Okay, this student is not motivated. Wait a minute. What we see is typically the, the, the tip of the iceberg. When you see a student who's passive, when we see a student, you know, that's looking out the window or, you know, keeps on doodling and uh, is not paying any attention, it may be, you know, lack of interest. It may be that he or she, you know, as I said before, you know, maybe, you know, they don't relate to what's being, to what's been done in class. It may be, you know, that the choice of the task is not good for them. It may be, you know, that the, 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 the teacher is not offering, you know, sufficient variety. It may simply be, you know, know that the student again is going through a rough time and so is looking apathetic okay and so it's a it's a way of, of protecting himself or herself okay so so lack of engagement is not necessarily lack of motivation it may be lack of interest or, or lack of focus simply you know today uh, what we, we, we what we've said it many times okay so today you know attention is under siege Okay, so um, getting the students to pay attention to you, okay, is a is a is a pretty tough challenge for any teacher, and not only the teachers, you know, teach teenagers. Incidentally, okay, so we all have you know problems, you know, with maintaining our attention and focus. Okay, so uh, so this is a this is something that we we need to we need to uh, think about. So we spoke about you know the. Very briefly, I said before, you know, that we know from research that there is a there is a connection between these two. Well, obviously, it's a they're two closely related aspect of the same uh, phenomenon. So they feed off each other, motivation and uh, and the and, and sorry, motivation and emotions. Well, if we if we're feeling if we're feeling happy, if we're feeling joyful, if we're feeling excited about learning, well, then, you know, this is going to feed our motivation. But on the other hand, okay, so if we're feeling motivated to learn, okay, this is going to result to, to more excitement, more joy, more curiosity, um, and more happiness. So there are two closely related aspects, okay, of the same, of the same issue in reality. It's clear that, you know, that if you're feeling if you're experiencing, you know, pleasant emotions, okay, this is going to be good because, you know, you're looking forward to participating more actively and participating more thoroughly in what's going on in class. All right. So I think it's it's important to it's important to remember these things. Um, the the um, 
in the literature there and the, there's there is a lot of literature on student motivation there is there is much less on teacher motivation which i'm not going to touch on today but it's a it's a very interesting topic you know and especially nowadays you know there's so many teachers are quitting okay the profession so what motivates us teachers but today you know we're only going to focus on the students motivation so um uh, Essentially, you know, most people talk about two different types, even though, you know, there's more. Okay, so intrinsic motivation, okay, um, intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation uh, is this um, drive that derives, you know, from doing a certain task. Okay, so there is a fascination uh, drawn, you know, from 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 a subject or from a from a certain task it's what psychologists psychologists called autotelic so there is an, a sense of fulfillment that comes from a task itself okay so there is no uh, there is no uh, external source of motivation so this it's that's why it's called it's intrinsic it's called intrinsic because you know the the the, the source the drive is internal and motivation really is okay a personal internal journey there is another type of uh, motivation that most people you know will be familiar with, and that's called extrinsic. Extrinsic, you know, the, the the drive is external. So typically, you know, I need to study for my exam because you know if I don't study for my exam, I won't pass it. So that's the reward. I need to do it, or I'm going to be in trouble, or I don't know. Um, for a, for an athlete, okay, I need to work out really hard, okay. Otherwise, you know, I won't be able to make it to the Olympics. I'm not going to be able to make it to Wimbledon, okay. So, so the the uh, the reward is external; it's not internal. Now, most people think, you know, that intrinsic motivation is a superior form of motivation. It's not. It, we're talking really. We're talking about you know two speed system. You have intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. As teachers, you know, we have to make up, make sure you know that what types of motivation you just, um, drive the students. But I mean, not one is not necessarily superior. It is true that when somebody is intrinsically motivated, okay, this type of motivation is more easily sustainable throughout the lesson, throughout the course throughout the semester. Yes, because I have an inherent interest in, in this topic. I like English, okay? I find that a fascinating language, okay? I could see myself, you know, communicating in English, you know, with people from all over the world. That's my internal drive, okay? Uh -huh. So it's long-term, it's easier to sustain. On the other hand, extrinsic motivation is also useful, you know, when we're talking about short-term goals, as I said before, the exam. Not everybody is necessarily intrinsically motivated of in, uh, by, uh, by learning English, okay? So, and I think, you know, we have to come to terms with that. So it is up to us, I think, you know, to play with both these types of motivation without necessarily um, without necessarily you know, uh, uh, emphasizing that intrinsic motivation is a superior form of motivation, that's that's not that's really not true. Okay, so we need to we need to play around with both. This is a million million dollar question. Okay, so when I started when I started off teaching a long time ago, this was one question you know that I I, I used to ask myself all the time: How do I motivate my learners? How can I do more? What can I do differently? Okay, how come is this person not, not not learning? Okay, so what can I do more? And I was very quick in that beating my own chest, you know, mea culpa, mea culpa. And I, and, and teachers, you know, are very are very good at doing that. I found that throughout the years, especially you know through my work with teachers. It turns out though that this is not the right question to ask oneself, in my opinion. If you ask that question like that, how do I motivate learners? It almost means it's, you know, that, that that motivation is something that gets done to you. But motivation is not something that gets done to you. Motivation is a personal journey. You either have it or you don't have it. So I, I found out that, you know, that in fact, you know, what works for me is not so much, you know, how do I motivate my learners, but what can I do? To, to help my learners motivate themselves. In other words, how can I create a motivating environment, an environment whereby the students, you know, motivate themselves? And I think, you know, this is a much more interesting question uh, because uh, personally, I don't really believe that you can learn, you can motivate anybody to do anything for you. Just because, as I said before, you know, motivation is such a personal journey, and and you know, especially if we're talking about intrinsic motivation. Okay, so I think you know what 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 psychologists talk about self determination. That's exactly precisely what it means. So, in order for somebody to feel motivated, they have to have a sense of agency. Okay, they have to have a. Uh, autonomy, independence. Okay, so there's only so much I can do in terms of you know motivate. Yes, I could have a motivating behavior in class. 
that I can do. I can model motivation for my students. That I can do and I have to do as a teacher and as a leader. Okay, but I think you know the most important thing is you know to try and uh, and um, and and create an environment okay that is conducive to the students' own motivation. And this is, I think, this is you know the ABC of learning. I, I if I could just say you know very quickly, I think you know in our profession here we've been too uh, worried. We worry, we've been worrying too much about the content and about the 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 the, the curriculum. Okay, and and I, I and I think you know that in fact you know the the element of pastoral care. Okay, so listen to the students and 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 you know making the students you know more aware of their emotions. Okay, so uh, also you know modeling emotional intelligence. This this idea that you have to listen to the students and what they have to say. They have to help the students you know recognize and identify their emotions because if they recognize and identify their emotions, then they can they can deal with them. Okay, and they perhaps you know can be more successful. I think you know that this aspect you know has been uh, grossly neglected in teacher training colleges, and so. Uh, but although you know, I have, I'm pleased to say you know that things you know seem to be things seem to be changing now. So, um, how can I do that? Okay, so I think you know that it's interesting. One thing you know that that, that that I think we have to do, we have to listen to the students. Okay, we have to go back straight to the horse's mouth, and that's precisely what I did. You know, when I uh, prior to writing a book in 2017 on motivation, I decided to. Uh, interview about 135 students of mine. Okay, so and I asked them, you know, two very simple but powerful questions. Okay, so question number one was, what is one what is one thing that we do in class that you find motivating? And I was thinking about, you know, teachers' behavior, um, the group, um, the nature of tasks. You know, I left it open. Okay, I didn't I didn't give them any suggestions. And also question number two, what do you find demotivating? Uh, interestingly. One of the things that the, the 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 students said, okay, is that they want exercises, they want tasks. They find it motivating when the task uh, uh, makes them uh, when the tasks promote a sense of friendship. You know, and why should I be surprised? Isn't teaching a social activity? Aren't we humans, social animals? Aren't we always looking for connections and connectedness? Okay. Aren't we always looking to belong to a certain place? Let me give you an example. If tonight you were to join a, I don't know, a yoga group for the first time, or if you were taking, I don't know, if you had taken your tennis lessons for the first time, okay, you've never played tennis, you've never done yoga in your life. How would you feel? If on the one hand, you may be feeling enthusiastic and excited. OK, on the other hand, I bet, you know, that there is a lot of negativity flying all over the place. You feel like, OK, what if what if I'm uh, the, the rest of the group is better than me? What if the teacher doesn't like me? What if I don't like the teacher? What if the group doesn't like me? What if I'm not accepted? OK, what if I don't trust the teacher? So there's a whole bunch of different, you know, negative statements and questions, you know, that, that just, you know, uh, inhabit our mind. So there's a lot of negativity. So we feel stressed. OK, and so what we're looking for, OK, and this is how the stress is going to disappear. We're looking for a leader, OK, that acknowledges that, OK, because, you know, that's exactly how our students feel. OK, so when they join a group for the first time, that's exactly what they're feeling. OK, so I don't know anybody here. I don't know the teacher. OK, so I, this is a new place for me. Maybe, you know, maybe the other people's level of English is better than mine. OK, maybe somebody in the group, you know, doesn't like me. So what they're looking for is a sense of palpable belongingness. That's what it's called. So it's, in other words, affiliation. You're feeling affiliated when you feel like you belong to a certain group. Belonging to a certain group, it means that you've been accepted by a group. Accepted, not simply tolerated. If somebody tolerates your presence, this is not all that positive. Affiliation is something else. Affiliation basically means, yes, I found my niche. I found my place in this group, and I'm already looking forward to it. So there is a stress-free, positive, warm climate Okay, um, um, uh, built by the teacher, created by the teacher as a leader. So. If you don't think affiliation is very important, think about the opposite of affiliation. What is the opposite of affiliation? The opposite of affiliation is alienation. Alienation is when somebody is on the edge of the group, okay? It's been 
marginalized almost. Okay, so he or she doesn't feel like they belong to the group. Now, how do you think? What sort of you know emotions you know somebody you know who's feeling alienated is going to display in class? Well, possibly you know some of the emotions we we evoked earlier. Okay, so lethargic. Okay, or you know, um, uh, or apathetic. Okay, or disengaged. Or sometimes you know these people you know create discipline problems. So promoting affiliation okay is one of our is one of our uh, most important tasks okay so how do we do that well i think you know uh, what what uh, educational psychologists advocate is you know one thing that we have to do in, in classes you know promoting uh, 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 helping uh, helping students you know find common ground and this is pretty simple to understand you know uh, i mean you know, this is what we always do I mean, if we, if we, if we take, you know, the, if you leave the classroom for, for a while, okay, and, and focus on, on, um, I don't know, I don't mean, you, you imagine you, you, you go into a party, you go into a dinner party, you don't know anybody, you don't really want to go, but you, in the end, you decide to go, okay, so you have a couple of drinks, okay, and you feel, you know, you've, you've had enough, you want to go back home. As you get ready to go back home, you bump into somebody, okay, who, and you strike up, strike up a conversation with them, okay, and you realize that you're both teachers, that you both like music, that you both like sports, that you both went to the same school, that you live in the same neighborhood, and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden, you don't want to leave anymore, or not so fast any, any, anyway. Why? Because, you know, you found that common ground, okay? So, so um, this is, a, no, this is a, a social situation but isn't a classroom a social setting of course it is a classroom is a microcosm of our larger society and in in our society okay so people you know live you know people want to be connected with with uh i mean there are exceptions of course you know but we want to be connected you know we are we are social creatures okay so we 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 have the psychological need okay for social connection and so the job of a teacher okay is to create an environment that is psychologically safe and that promotes affiliation through helping the students finding a common ground so i think you know this is not just you know when the group gets together for the first time you know but because you know the group is a dynamic entity Okay, that's why we talk about you know group dynamics. Okay, so it's it is it is it is, a, it is the job of a teacher to pay close attention to what's going on within this this several uh, group members. Okay, and and make sure you know that there is a sufficient uh, degree of tolerance and acceptance and trust and respect, uh, which must be reciprocal. So the teacher, the student, students, teacher, and so on and so forth. So perhaps you know the best way to well, not the best, you know, but certainly you know very useful way to achieve this is to create and design activities that on the one hand get the students to work on language because we teach language and on the other hand you know they promote a sense of connectedness okay so there are uh, there's no time for me to demonstrate these here but you know but there is there is a lot of uh, there's there, there there are a lot of activities you know to work on both on both um, aims out there Okay, so I think you know this is this is hugely important. So that's the quote from um, uh, Jean Louis. Jean Louis is, was a student of mine, um, and this is what he said. Okay, I'm quoting verbatim. I, I should also say, you know, that I interviewed these people in French. Okay, so this is my translation. So uh, because you know I didn't want any 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 misunderstandings. And I didn't want them to feel that they were being tested. So the interview was carried out in French. It's a pretty powerful uh, quote if you think about it. Okay. So this is, and, and also a, a further demonstration of how emotions, you know, get, in, get into play, <laughs> excuse me, with motivation. Okay. So I find it motivating. Okay. When I don't just do an exercise that gets me to work on language, but I also want an exercise. Okay. That, that brings me closer to the rest of the group. Okay. So I'm not suggesting that, and they're not suggesting that everybody should be friends, that they should be going out or, you know, become best friends. So that's not the point. Okay. The point is, you know, uh, they want to feel, feel part of a group. Okay, and I think it, again it highlights the social aspect of what we have to do. Perhaps you know uh, um, we we uh, this is often neglected, you know, but I think you know we should really think about it. 
Okay, so yes, the curriculum, yes, the content, okay, but yes, the exam, but I think, you know, the, 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 the teaching is essentially, a quintessentially, you know, social endeavor. It's done, it's done with people, uh, with people in a shared uh, physical place, and it's regulated by interactions. It's, you know, it's regulated by interactions, regulated by communication. We ask questions, we give answers, people ask an, an answer question. So there's this constant dialogue. There is, uh, so so language is, is all over the place. So uh, I think it's important to, to remember this. So when students feel affiliated, when students feel that they belong to a certain group, they, they tend to, to feel happier and less stressed. And that's quite an achievement if you think about it. Okay, so so far we've spoken about the nature of motivation. Okay, uh, we so motivation again is why we do what we do, um, and now you know we we're talking to we're listening to what the, my students say, and 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 what they find motivating, and how this you know um, um, uh, uh, fits in with uh, the the emotional aspects it could fit in you know with the um, uh, motivation motivational issues that we're discussing now let's move on there's tons of research that shows that um when you ask uh, a, a teenager okay how he or she feels uh, they come up you know with uh, language that's not really positive okay so stressed negative about this negative about that apprehensive and i think you know this is something that we need to take into consideration as leaders and teachers are leaders okay so we we, we are leaders because you know we, we we're the ones you know have to provide the group you know with the sense of direction with the ones you know the, with uh with uh you know uh with instructions, you know, with the ones with the mission and the vision for this class and, and the way we teach and the way we expect students to learn. So we need to listen to what the students say. And unfortunately today, if you're dealing with teenagers, okay, teenagers are going through a really rough time. We we don't really have time and other people, you know, would do that in other webinars or have done that in other webinars. Uh, but this is, this is unfortunately, it is a fact. So hence the need for affiliation. I think also one thing that a teacher can do, okay, in the way you uh, you promote a, a an, an environment, you know, that is conducive to motivation. It's it's the way we speak sometimes. Okay, let me give you an example. I mean, how many times have I said to the, to my students, you know, when I see them coming into the classroom, you know, looking a little bit, you looking tired, looking, oh dear, you look so tired today. But wait a minute, this is my assumption, you know. I don't know for a fact that they look tired. Maybe they maybe they're worried, you know. Maybe they they're you know maybe they took a test to uh, you know before coming into the English class and they didn't do so well. Maybe you know they're worried about the test that they're going to take after the English class. There may be you know a host of different reasons. Okay, but I think you know what? Why is this? Uh, I consider this the wrong way to talk to the students. Well, because I'm making assumptions. I'm making assumptions on behalf of my students. So, what's better, in my opinion? Well, if I think that the students, you know, lack the, 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 the a certain type of energy, okay, this is what I ask them from zero to five. How much energy do you have today? And if they say zero, fine, I have to accept that. But it's coming from them. Okay, so. I'm achieving two things, you know, with this simple question. Number one, I, I, I'm, I'm getting the students to focus on how how the, the feeling, the emotions that they're experiencing, okay, in the here and now, okay, number one. And number two, okay, so I, I have some feedback because, you know, the, according to what they say, if they say zero energy, well, maybe I have to shuffle things around and change, uh, and change things around, you know, and do something completely different. Okay, so this is very important. But I think, you know, it's a question like this, but from zero to five, et cetera, is respectful of your teaching, of your students. And this is how, you know, uh, this is this is also a way, you know, for teachers to build a, 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 a positive, warm, stress-free climate. So we've spoken about this. Okay, so they, we, they feed each other. So, and... Uh, motivation, emotion, you know, you can't focus on one without focusing on the other. There's another way, I think, you know, that uh, uh, 
uh, something else you know that 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 comes into the equation here does the concept of self efficacy self efficacy basically means you know the feeling good about something that you know how to do it's the it's a concept you know um 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 um, uh, talk, um, uh, put forward by a Stanford psychologist, Alfred Bandura, self-efficacy, or some people call it perceived competence. Basically, you know, when you when you feel that competent in a certain area, okay, this is going to fuel your motivation. So um, let me give you an example. If you want to teach me Polish or uh, any of the languages, you know, that I, I, I could see, you know, my, in the, in the, in the chat box here, any language that I don't speak, let's see, let's stick to Polish. Okay, so um, if you want, if you want to teach me Polish, imagine you know I have a I have a basic level Polish. Okay, so um, imagine I'm A two, for example. It's not true, but let's just uh, let's just uh, for the sake of the argument. If you if you want to if you want me to be motivated in a task, okay, so you have to try and and and. Uh, present me with the task around a topic that I know something about. So for me, it would be music or playing the guitar or jazz. Okay, so I'm a big jazz fan. So if you present me with a with simple task around jazz in Polish, I will be I will be more motivated to do it. In any case, I will try harder. Why? Because I feel a sense of competence in that particular in, in that particular subject. I know about jazz. I want to know. I want to know more about jazz in Polish. I want to learn a few a few new words in Polish. Okay, so so this is the drive, you see. And conversely, okay, if you present me with the task around gardening or cooking, because I couldn't care less about gardening, and I couldn't care less about about uh, cooking. You've lost me. All right. So because I don't feel I don't I'm not interested in these two subjects, and I don't feel confident. I don't feel competent in either gardening or cooking. So you've lost me. You killed my motivation. So. So this is going to result in unpleasant feelings. Okay, so if you keep this up, okay, if you keep me, if you keep presenting me with tasks, you know, around gardening and cooking, this is going to result in anger. And in any case, disillusionment and disengagement. So you see how the choice of materials, okay, has a, it's a double tier. Okay, so either it could either lead to more motivation, okay, or it could totally destroy what motivation I have left. So it's called self-efficacy. It's called, some people call it perceived competence, but self-efficacy is, is what, um, so which basically follows, you know, that, that from this, okay, that we have to provide the students with opportunities for success. So the way to do this, well, one of the ways to do this is to give the students tasks that are challenging, but they are attainable. So the question you could uh, you could ask me at this point is what is a challenging task? Can you define challenge in education? Well, some of the people have done it for me. Mihai sent me high, for example, a Hungarian-born psychologist of University of Chicago. He developed you know this concept of flow. So you're in a state of flow, okay, when you are totally immersed, okay, in what you're doing. So this is basically intrinsic motivation at its peak, okay, and you become completely oblivious to everything and everybody around you. Okay, so challenge is basically the point of equilibrium, the right point of balance between what the task asks the students to do, okay, and the level of competence of the students. So let me give you an, a, a practical classroom example. If you're dealing with advanced students, say C1, if you ask C1 students, okay, uh, 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 to, I don't know, to recite the alphabet, for example, this is not gonna be challenging. So you're destroying the motivation. They're not gonna get engaged. You know, they, they probably, you know, they throw furniture at you and they would, be, they, would be, they would be right to do that. Conversely, if you ask a beginner, A1, okay, to read a Shakespeare sonnet, okay, and, and, and analyze it, okay, well, the, the same thing. Nothing can ever happen because, you know, the level of challenge is not appropriate. So when there is a balance between the student's level of competence, okay, and the outcome of the task, well, this is where you have, this is where you have challenge. If it's too easy, you know, the students are going to cruise through the task, but they're not going to be, they're not going to be challenging. They're not going to be challenged. So the level of motivation is not going to necessarily increase. At the same time, if the, if the students, if the task is impossible, same thing. Okay, it's not challenging. Challenge doesn't mean impossible. Impossible means, you know, I can't do it. If I can't do it, in fact, I'm going to be demoralized. Okay, I'm going to be uh, demotivated. So 
let's play around with this concept of challenge and what it means. Okay, so I think, you know, that in order for us, you know, to come up with the challenging exercise, we need to know our students. Okay, so we need to know our students in terms of, you know, what they can do, but also what they can't do with the language, but also in terms of interests, in terms of, um, of uh, what the focus is. Okay, so that's that's I think it's a very important thing. Uh, another thing that we could do is you know to offer choice and autonomy. Okay, so when you give options, choice, uh, a sense of autonomy, uh, motivation will increase. Why? Especially if we, if we're dealing with teenagers. Okay, teenagers, you know, are at a, at an age okay where the 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 being assertive. Okay, they're trying to you know they're trying to they're experimenting with their independence, with their autonomy. Okay, then that all, that works in class as well. Okay, so when you give the students autonomy and choices, okay, and options, okay, do you make them on the one hand you make them more responsible for learning. On the other hand, okay, you give them a sense of agency. Okay, so so you tell me. Okay, so think about three things that you think you're good at. Okay, let's work let's work around those. For example, okay, so I think you know this is a. Excuse me. This is uh, this is a very important, and there are lots of tasks that you could do around this. Okay. Um, one more thing that's very important. You know, let's praise the students for the effort. Okay. So again, praising the students for the effort. Okay, is important because uh, the, the, if you don't praise them, effort means uh, you see uh, hard work always pays off. Okay, so you worked really hard. So I'm praising you for your resilience, for your uh, persistence in learning. Okay, so this is it's it's really it's really interesting. Okay, so, so you're modeling, you know, a good a good way to good a a, a useful way to work. Okay, so uh, conversely, if you praise the students for their intelligence, okay, well, once the student has a, has understood that the teacher thinks he or she is intelligent, you know, they go on automatic pilot. Okay, so so you you want to you want to praise them for the effort that they that they put in. So um, I think it's I, I think you know uh, uh, all this hinges on the way we communicate with our with our students and 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 teachers you know um, we we're communication experts, so we should be able to find the right words. Okay, to to strike the right chord with our students using positive language. So uh, uh, giving giving the students feedback, okay? So uh, th there are different ways of giving, so feedback, as we all know, feedback should be specific. So good job doesn't do it, okay? But good job, I like the way you structured your essay, okay? That's that's a little bit more specific. I found that it makes a difference also when, when uh, I tell my students, well, okay, you 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 made progress in this area, but we still need to work on this. We still need to work on this. And so the the impression I have from from my students when I because I I ask for feedback. Okay, so it's you know they they feel like they don't feel alone in this. We need to work on this. We need to make sure that we don't repeat the same mistake. We need to we need to um, find a way to say this better and more eloquently uh, and so on and so forth. I think it's nice, you know, the student feels like, okay, that it's a team effort, even though he or she knows that it's down to how much work they put in and not the teacher. And so that's what I mean by positive language. I don't mean, you know, touchy feely sort of, you know, um, uh, everything is great and everything is cool and everything is memorable what the students do. No, I think, I think the positive language doesn't mean that you only have to highlight what's good about the student's production. The, the thing, the thing about giving feedback that's all that's only negative is that you know that with this you know um, uh, correction, you know you correct every single mistake, you know. And I know the students like to be corrected, but I, I but let's think about this though. I mean, when you when you spend too much time, you know, correcting the students' mistakes, you probably don't have enough time to highlight what the students do good do well and they they you know it's it's it, so basically the message that we're sending across again the washback effect is very negative i'm only interested in your mistakes but i'm you know but I, it's almost as if you know i don't notice okay what you do well with the language and how much progress you've made in this or that area i think you know we need to find a sense of balance and and um, unfortunately you know most people you know when they think uh, correction uh, feedback they only think about correcting people's mistakes 
So I think all these things, you know, can contribute, you know, to a, to a, a more positive climate, okay, in which we saw we saw it before. So which could increase our students' motivation. There's one more one more thing, you know, that is linked to the idea of challenging, and that is the value of surprise. Okay, so surprising your students, surprising, not shocking them. If you shock them, you lose them. Surprising the students is is uh, is a terrific way of uh, of uh, working on the, on the motivation. What is surprise? Well, surprise is the gap between what the students expect and the reality. So, if you if you do a reading comprehension exercise, okay, the way you've always done it, okay, you're not going to surprise anybody. So, which doesn't mean that it's necessarily bad, okay. But if you're working on surprise, okay, well that that's not the way you do it. But if you do the reading, a reading comprehension exercise, okay, and you insert an element of surprise, an element of, you know, destabilization, well, the students, you know, guess what happens? They're going, to, they're going to pay attention. Getting the students to pay attention is already a big success these days. So when you surprise your students, the students, you know, they prick up their ears and say, oh, we've never done things this way. Okay, let me, let me, I want to know what's more of them. What, what this is about. I want to know more what this is about. So there is a sense of curiosity that gets going. Okay, so so from from surprise, surprise leads to attention. Attention leads to more engagement. So it's really, really important. So what is a way to surprise your students? Well, you know, stop doing what you've always done. Or you take, you know, an, a, another way to do it is, you know, take an activity, okay, and, and see, you know, what you can change. Okay, you don't have to come up, you know, with something from scratch. Okay, you can just adapt. You can just, you know, experiment with an activity or with the text that you've used, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, from the book, for example. Okay, and do it differently. Okay, um, or perhaps you know you you can do the opposite of something that you've you've all done. What I've described now is you know what it's what John Fancelow talked about in a, in a in a in a wonderful book called breaking conversations and, and breaking rules. Okay, so the best way to surprise your students is to break rules, okay? But you have to do it gradually and you, you also have to do it judiciously, okay? So you don't want to throw them off, okay? Students, you know, especially teenagers, you know, they're attached to a sense of routine. This is very important too, okay? But but surprising is, is huge. So all this, everything that we talked about so far, okay, wouldn't be possible and couldn't be possible without our creativity. This is what I, this is how, you know, I, I, to bring everything, everything home, okay? Without creativity, okay? What is creativity? First of all, very quickly, okay? Creativity is the the, the skill, the, 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 the combination of skills that we use to come up with an exercise that is both new and has pedagogical value, okay? So if I believe in creativity, if I come up, you know, with something new, okay, well, Guess what happens? Okay, there is a, 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 an increased surprise, a sense of curiosity, excitement, which leads to attention. Okay, so when the students are surprised, curious, excited, and they pay attention, they're focused, okay, probably this is going to translate into higher achievement, which is going to fuel my own motivation, okay, to try again, because I could see, you know, that my creative ideas, okay, produce uh, um, uh, yield, you know, good, good success, and and uh, and, uh, um, uh, and 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 uh, and and motivate the students. So this is basically, you know, what um, what I'm talking about. So for me, creativity is not something you do on a Friday afternoon because the sun is out and off we we'll go to the beach. But creativity really is. In fact, you know, it shouldn't even be called creativity. I call it, you know, pedagogical, uh, a, ped a, a pedagogical creativity, a pedagogical creative approach to. Um, to teaching, because I think it really is, you know, uh, or could be, you know, uh, one of one of our best, one of our best brands. So, to wrap up, okay. So we we saw, you know, how it is a complex motivation is very complex, and I think you know we, in order, you know, to get our students going, okay. So with and and perhaps you know, uh, uh, design a series of tasks you know, to yield motivation. We need to pay close attention to how the students are feeling. We have to pay close attention to the to the fact, you know, the teaching is a social endeavor. Okay, it's a human um, that we're all, you know, social creatures. We have to be able to um, use creativity to come up, you know, with an exercise. You know, the the, the push to, push is the wrong word that that uh, that uh, encourage the students, you know, to 
to, to um, that encourage affiliation that uh, that bring the students closer to one another. Okay, to to create you know a sense of belonging. Okay, that connectedness that makes us that makes us um, uh, that makes it that, that makes humans you know who 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 they are. So without creativity, we we cannot do that. Okay, so that's the that's basically you know what I what I wanted to talk about. So um, I'm, uh, I think I'm right on time and I, I'm uh, looking forward to your uh, questions and comments. Thank you so much for participating in this. And I, I hope, you know, I've managed doing uh, 45 minutes, you know, but 45 minutes is just, you know, enough, you know, to scratch the tip of the iceberg. But I, I hope, you know, I've managed to give you sufficient food for reflection. Looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chaz. It's been a very, very informative, like 40, 45 minutes. Yeah, teachers have, have been discussing like a heatedly in the chat box and we have received tons of questions. So I just have to pick like a one or two of them. Yeah, yeah to give you uh, yeah some time to explain a little bit further. So okay. the first question is from Fernando, he uh, I'm not sure he or she has raised a lot of questions. Um, the first question would be, what kind of teacher motivation would influence or affect students' motivation? Especially maybe what kind of negative emotions from teachers might have an impact on the students' motivation? If, if our motivation has an impact on the students' motivation? If that's- Yeah, the te teacher's emotion or teacher's like uh, um, feelings in the classroom might affect students' motivation. Oh. Well, yes. I mean, you know, uh, emotions are contagious. You know, if I'm feeling downbeat, if, I, if I'm feeling angry, if I'm feeling unfocused, the students are going to notice. So whatever we do in class, you know, models, you know, uh, the way the students behave for the better, or for the worse. So we, we have a really tough job because, you know, we have to teach even when we don't feel emotionally stable, you know, or ready. So I, I think, you know, and this is, uh, I don't really like, you know, like giving tips, you know, but I can only talk about my experience. You know, if I'm not having a good day before going into class, I always try to find 10 or 15 or 20 minutes before class to spend on my own, go for a walk and check in with myself and see if I am physically, psychologically and emotionally ready okay, to walk into a classroom. Because if I'm not, you know, I, I need to make a, a super effort. How, for example, for me, what works is motivation, you know, uh, sorry, <laughs> motivation, meditation, sorry. So I, I try, you know, and I, I, I find a quiet place and I try and collect my thoughts, okay? And I, I try to have a clear mind before walking into a classroom. But I understand that meditation may not be a thing for everybody, but that's what I do and it works for me. So... But yes, the way the way we'll behave in class has a huge impact on the way the students behave. Yes, I think we we actually had a talk last Friday about teachers like uh, yes. wellness. Yeah, yes. how to do meditation. Yes. Yeah, how to keep our like motivation or emotion stable yes. before yes. we yeah step into the classroom. Yes. Yes, because so, we, yeah. we we're always talking about the students' well being, you know. But we I, we you know we need to take care of ourselves too, because you know teachers teachers are human beings, and teachers too are going through a very very rough time, and this is across the board, you know. So education systems, you know, the world over, you know, they're in a state of profound crisis. You know, teachers are leaving the profession. It's really difficult to find a somebody who wants to be a teacher you know no matter where you live okay so so uh yeah so we yeah, need and, we need to look after ourselves yes that's right and teacher jane is asking about the name of the book is it called breaking conversations yes and the the, the author is john fancelow she may she may be able jane you may be able to find it on uh if you look it up uh if you look john fancelow up online Yes. So thank you very much for all the questions raised by you guys, but we don't have all the time to answer them. So please, yeah, uh, forgive me for only picking like one or two questions from the teachers. And thank you very much, Chaz, for your very, very brilliant and inspirational like sure. uh, session. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. And, uh, thank you very much. And thank I look you, forward to see you soon, Chaz. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. And now before we move on,
I just want to quickly give you a, like a heads up about a tool that you can use to maybe uh, motivate your students by Macmillan education. As Chaz has mentioned in his session, getting like students to pay attention to their emotional state can help uh, students to like uh, sustain their motivation to learn. So that is why teachers of teenagers like you need to make sure that your students learning environment is psychologically um, like safe and the students have an opportunity to understand and be friend with their emotions. So this uh, book called Get Involved is a, a book for teenager learners. And we have built in a lot of social and emotional skills practice and a lot of like real life uh, content to create an inclusive classroom to give your students a, a lot of like opportunities to practice their social and emotional learning skills. So if you're interested in knowing more about getting involved, you can go to this website, macmillanenglish.com slash get involved. You will find out more sample units and introduction about the course book 